buy truth. Money can purchase commodities, but not comfort. Branches, but not righteousness. Ships, but not salvation. And hotels, but not heaven. To save your money, you must share it. To love it, you must lose it. And to invest it forever, you must put it in eternal things. I have to speak the truth and I have to 
speak what the scripture says. This is where it is. And my family, we're beelining there. We're just not there yet. We're, we're almost there. We're just not there yet. But we're almost there. And when we get there, oh, you're going to know. You're going to know because we're just going to scream the entire week. We're not going to say anything without screaming. So that's how we're going to be for an entire week. Today we're going to be in uh, Psalms 37, verse 21. 37, verse 21. Why is it that debt is such a bad thing? Because giving is such a great thing. And how can we give when we have nothing to give? Psalm 37, verse 21. Let's all stand down and read the Lord's Word. If you've got your phones, open to Facebook or Twitter. This will also be our Twitter post of the day. The wicked borrows and does not pay back, but the righteous is gracious and gives. How many of us want to be gracious and give? How many of us want to borrow money and never give it back? <laughs> Some of you are authentically true. I, that does sound really kind of cool, honestly. Yeah. As Christians, we are called to be gracious and to give. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for all that you've given to us. Lord, I ask that you speak to us, Father, as we've gathered to hear your voice. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said, Amen. You may be seen. The poison of death is that it keeps us from experiencing the life that Jesus Christ intends for us to experience. In John 10, 10, 10, he says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come to give you life and life more abundant. And we use that life more abundant sometimes and strap ourselves down into debt. Because the fact of the matter is, when, when you owe folks money, you don't have money to really give to folks or be able to provide for your needs. It really causes a hardship. One of the leading causes of divorces today concerns money. Proverbs 22, 7 says, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is a slave to the lender. Debt is a cause, is a cause. As the Bible says, money is a root. That is a cause for strangling out your Christian life. Because how can we be giving when we have to work three or four jobs just to make ends meet? That doesn't sound right, does it? But some of us, one of those, have to pick up an extra job here or there just to knock a debt out. I am not unfamiliar with working three to four jobs at a time just to knock out a debt and to get it out from underneath. We're over, honestly, family. Debt keeps us from fully experiencing the life that God intends for us to experience. The foundation of this psalm, Psalm 37, 21, is found in Deuteronomy 15, 6. And that's also on your, um, um, on your um, paper there. Deuteronomy 15, I'm just going to read verse 6. For the Lord will, your God, will bless you as he has promised you and who has lent to many nations. But you will not borrow and you will rule over many nations, but they will not rule over you. You see the biblical rule of success? You will not borrow, and you will rule. You will rule. One place that I know that many of us, I don't know everybody's financial situation, but I can promise you, I can assume this, is that most of us are not even kingdoms over our own houses because the bank owns our own. I don't even own the little track of soil that my house sits on. Own my truck. So if the bank decides to take my home, I'll live in my truck. <laughs> I own it. Try to take it from me. <laughs> the first thing that we can see here is that we're called to be holy and not to build debt. Not to build. Some of you are like, well, man, how am I to afford a home? You know, how am I supposed to be able to get things in life unless I have a good credit score or build lead and have a loan and be able to get that? Well, there are ways. There are ways. Now, I have a mortgage, unfortunately, but that thing has, has a life expectancy for which I will take it in the backyard and shoot it when it's done. <laughs> Set it ablaze. But we are not to build debt. We're not continually to reap and reap and throw upon us and throw upon us all this money that we cannot pay back. In 
says borrows but does not repay. The wicked borrows money but does not <coughs> repay the money. So the wicked actually breaks the eighth commandment of do not steal by not repaying the debt. I'm going to take the money but I'm not going to repay you back although it's yours. I'm going to steal it. It's going to be mine. See, the righteous pay their debts and give money generously. Those who give mercifully in God's cause proper prosper in the end. An old German proverb says this, before borrowing money from a friend, you better decide which one you need more. <laughs> Did you hear that one? Yeah, some of us laugh because we have experience and it's painful. The German proverb continues to say, he who borrows sells his freedom. <coughs> the freedom that Christ died for, Galatians 5.1, it was the freedom that Christ has set us free. But yet we throw ourselves under this financial debt to other folks, placing ourselves under slavery once again. It seems like we like slavery. We like for other folks to tell us how to do what to do and when to do it. Catch this. Consider this passage talking about God and, and our position with God. Malachi 3, 8 through 10. Will a man rob from God? Yet you are robbing from ye. But, but you say, how have we robbed you, God? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed a curse, and you are robbing uh, from me the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And test me now on this, says the Lord of hosts, if it will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out blessings until it overflows. Many of us say that we would like to give to missions or ministries more. I would love to support missionaries more out of my personal family. We do as a church, but I'd love to do it more. Can't because I owe, and I owe, and I owe. And I have to pay off those debts. Debts keep us from supporting God's kingdom while we're here, because we don't have it to give. Have you noticed though? It says the wicked borrows but does not repay. The wicked here in Psalms are, are people that are not purposefully wicked. They didn't like go out and like take a, a college class on how to be wicked 101. It wasn't like they bought the How to Be Wicked for Dummies book. It's not like they Googled top ten ways to be wicked today. And it's not like they went out to go watch the play wicked. It's not like it's intentional that they want to be wicked, but it actually, wickedness happens most times unintentionally. Why is it that people or folks become in debt? Well, they're careless on, on paying back or, or cannot. They do take out money, and they believe they can repay it back. They're like, well, I've got this much money, and I can't repay it back. In six months, I'll have it all repaid back. And there's always this plan. There's always this justification. But why can't someone repay it back sometimes? Because the person overextends themselves. You know, thinks a little too much, speculates on, on how much they can really give. And they're really not looking at their life righteously or logistically like, can I really afford that? When you and I, I and us, get into debt, or have gotten into debt, it's because we overextend our finances and we overspeculate how much we can really, really be able to handle. But do not get confused. This whole thought with faith. I'm going to get into this, and God is providential enough to where He is going to supply my needs. Most times when we get into a situation, God allows us to sit there. Because if God always comes in and scoops us out like some Baskin Robbins God and makes us taste better than what we did before we ended up in the bowl, then how are we going to learn the lesson? How are we really going to know? Because here we go again. Give us another month and we're going to go right back into it. Here comes God again, making us, you know, picking us back up, cleaning us off again. Ah, and God is a God of salvation and God is a God of mercy. And if God wants to do that, that's God's business. But what we see throughout the Old and New Testament, God most often allows us to sit in our decisions. Sit filthy in our decisions. Faith is not speculation. Faith is not gambling. Well, if I do this, God will just miraculously just save me out of the, out of the lamp like a genie. He'll just pop up and just like, and, and, and pull me and my family out of this. <clears throat> Faith is proof in experience. Faith is proof in promise. 
promise. What is faith? I follow God. I've experienced this God. I've not seen Him, but I know how God works because I've read about Him throughout Scripture. I know how God likes to treat folks and, and how He likes to save folks. So I know whenever I do something like the children of Israel, He's going to leave and allow me to be enslaved. He's going to allow me to wander through the desert. He's going to allow this. Faith is also proof in a promise. God promises things about people that are good stories. We are called to be holy and not to build dead. But we're also called to be righteous and be generous with our finances. You're like, well, man, I can be generous and in debt. No, you can't. No, you can't. If you owe somebody money and you're giving out some money, you're giving out somebody else's money. That's called bad stewardship. And let me, let me bring this home to a personal example so I'm not hurting anybody's feelings too greatly this morning as most of us are sitting in here with debt. And most of us are not smiling and happy right now. So let me bring out a personal kind of illustration or testimony. How am I to be able to be generous whenever I've got mountains and mountains of debt? And of course, I give my time and I give... We, we really extend what we give to, to, our, to our building fund. But that's all that we, we can give to. And I had, I had some great causes. Some folks called me on the telephone this week. Some people stopped me. I can't give. I just cannot give. I would love to give to some of these organizations. I cannot give. Because I owe people. And so my priority in giving has to go to the people I owe. <clears throat> now whenever I get those people out of the way, and I don't know anybody, then I can start picking some charities. Then I can start picking some ministries. Then I can start picking these other things and really start giving. And really start helping. My wife and I, off of everything that we give, though, we start with our tithe. And our building offering is in that as well. And then we have to pay off all of our major bills. We got to eat, we got to sleep, we got to travel. And then we start paying our debts off. For us to be completely generous, it means that we've got to be good stewards and pull out of this debt. There are only two types of people that are truly called to be generous in this life. Christians and Chuck Norris. <laughs> Last week, since you enjoyed Chuck Norris so much, I decided to revisit him. <laughs> Chuck Norris is so generous that he loves giving pain in many ways. For example, there is no chin behind Chuck Norris's beard. There's only another fist. Isn't that awesome? When Chuck Norris had surgery, the anesthesia was applied to the doctors. Yeah. Chuck Norris can strangle you with a cordless telephone. Mm. Chuck Norris can hear sign language. Guess that one? That one's tough. <laughs> Chuck Norris is the only person that can punch a cyclop between the eye. <laughs> yeah, and that's all the Chuck Norris we've got today. Yeah. Yay, we, we buried Chuck Norris today. We are called to be righteous and be generous. Generosity identifies who you and I are. It identifies us. Generosity distinguishes the righteous from the wicked in, in Psalm 37, 21, and also in verse 26, I mean. They can afford open handedness because the future is secure. Their pathway is, 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 is secure. Their present is provided for. They're good stewards with what they've got, and although they may give more than what they have, they don't owe money. They've been good stewards, and God supplies the generosity. Because they're good stewards with it. It begins with being good stewards. They don't owe people. They give generously and God supplies. God will supply a giving heart, but not a heart that deals treacherously or unrighteously with money. Believers have proved that if a believer really wants to give, he will always have the means to do so. Always. Because a true believer, a true follower of Christ will be a good steward of his or her money. We'll not overextend and be in debt, but we'll be a good steward of his or her money. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8 says this, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having sufficiency in everything, 
You may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. An old Roman proverb says this about money. Money is like seawater. The more you drink, the thirstier you get. Generosity, though, is what we see here. But the righteous are gracious and give. Generosity is to be direct. Generosity is not just to scatter across however we want to because being good stewards, it's not my money to be just shotgun splatter with whatever I want to with it. See, the money that I have is still God's money. The things that I own are still God's, and so it is not mine, it's God's, and so being a good steward means there is even a priority in generosity. Follow along, because this could get kind of controversial. What we see uh, in the passage we're in verse 20, verse 20 says, But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of the land. They shall consume into smoke, shall they consume away. The priority of giving is to God and His people. After giving to His people, then we're allowed to give to other people that are not of God, as a testimony of Son. But our giving is to be directed toward God and His family, number one. Here at the church, our benevolence, we don't have a lot, but what we do have is very directed. It has to be very intentional. We have people calling all the time. We have people telling us very specific needs, and we have people telling us what we are to be doing. Now, you're a church. You're supposed to pay my bills. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. As to which I reply, you're a man. You're supposed to be working. Amen. <laughs> And then they want to start cussing. <laughs> well, don't call if you don't want to hear. I'm just telling you, all right? We do give a lot here at the church. If you check our treasury team, we give a lot. And it's tough because there's so many more needs and we want to give more and more, but it's hard because we don't have all the money in the world. Our priority here as a church is to assist our church family, number one. Our second priority is to assist everyone else. If we've got a family in need, which most often, most of our families don't even say anything. But when we find out the need, we try to help the best way we can. And then, as a sign of benevolence and evangelism, then we reach out to the community if there is a leftover to help. J. Vernon McGee says, the wicked are going to perish. Don't concern yourself with their prosperity. Not their needs, but their prosperity. That's God's department, and He'll take care of it. We are to direct our generosity primarily and first to the family. Why is that? Leviticus 25.35 Now in a case, a countryman of yours becomes poor in his means with regard to your, to, uh, to your altar, then you sustain him like a stranger or sojourner that he may live with you. If a countryman, if someone of, of who you are, that same lives, same family, uh, goes poor, sustain him first. Why? Because it's a bad testimony if we just let our own die away. We go out helping everybody else, and yet our own are floundering away. How would I look if I didn't support my children or my wife, but I went and I supported everybody else? Or how would I look as a pastor? If I went helping everybody else's needs, or somebody calls me at 2 a.m. in the morning and it happens, and it's fine, that's what I do, that's what I'm called to do. But yet when my wife says, hey, I need some help, and I'm like, forget you. Or my kid has a recital and I don't go. How would I look? I would look like a hypocrite, right? Yeah. I handle my own first. So if one of you guys call and my wife says, I need you. Tough turkey calling out. I can't help you. My wife needs you. My daughter and my soon to be son with a mustache is going to need you as well. <laughs> yes. I hope he's born and I hope immediately he comes out and punches the doctor in the nose. I love our doctor. She's a great lady. 
I just want him to come out fighting, you know? Maybe he just grabs him and still running around the hospital. I don't know. I think he's going to start walking right off. I think so. I'm really proud of this boy. Really am. We are called to direct our generosity, number one, to the family. What a testimony it would be if we neglected our members, but yet he gave everything to everybody else. What a testimony our church would be. It is awful. The righteous show mercy. The righteous ought to show mercy, number one, to the family, and then to everyone else. A very wealthy man said once, he said, I can only wear one suit at a time, eat one meal at a time, and sleep in only one bed at a time. Beyond all that, my money is a bother. Of course, many would like to be willing uh, to share in his bother. But what he meant <coughs> is that there is a limit to which material things can actually do for a person. There's only so much before we start giving it to help other folks. We are also called to be a steward. That means responsibility means more blessing. You know that when you're responsible with your money, God will bless you more. And let me stop right here real quick. We are not going to preach a prosperity gospel, okay? That if you give this, God automatically will do this. I cannot dictate what God does. I cannot force God to do something. I cannot give to you and say, God, give me, give me, give me. I can't do that. But it is true throughout Scripture. God blesses those that are blessing other people. We see that shouting through the Old and New Testament. Those that are good stewards, that are doing what God wants them to do, God reaps more on them. Why? Because he who is faithful in little will be faithful in much. But if we're not faithful in the little, how is he going to reap on much? God's not stupid. God's not going to bless you with a lot if you can't handle the little. The way we handle our debt, our money, will allow us to be blessed more. But because of debt, because of what we owe people, are we unworthy to administer to the creation? Are we unworthy to administer ministries? Are we unworthy? <clears throat> According to Augustine, say Augustine, since he is unworthy of the bread which he eats, what makes you think that he will be worthy to use and administer the whole creation? We can't even handle a little bit that we're allowed right now. How are we to expect to handle more? We pray for more. I know many of us do. I do. All of us do. But how are we expected to handle more? We can't even handle a little right. Have you ever heard that phrase, the devil's in the details? Yeah, because most often we're the devil. Because when we get into the details, we sometimes gloss over them overextend ourselves, don't really focus on them or do what we're called to do. And those details are what kill our families, our marriages, our households, our jobs, our churches. He was faithful in little. We faithful in much. Like some of you, I have debt. I'm not sure about your situation, but I know my wife and I have started making our debt work for what we're supposed to do. No longer does it dictate our household, although we still have some. We have it lined up, we have it ready to go, and we know when each day is going to be knocked out and out. We're telling our money what to do instead of allowing our money to tell us what to do. You do that in very practical ways, and we'll be talking more about this next week on budgeting and things of the sort. Today we want to talk about really the poison of debt. Most of us think debt is an issue because, well, I just don't have money to do more stuff with, and I want to do this. Honestly, debt keeps us from being the Christian that God's called us to be. Generous. Give. Help. When we knock out all those overextensions, then we have finances or we have resources. That's just not occurring in your wallet or your bank account. It really occurs all across the board. If you've had real debt, you know, real, real debt, you know, when you have like six days left of the month and you've got eight dollars left to feed a family of three, you know, and all you're eating are pinto beans for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. 
but you can't even afford to shop at all this. If you got a story like that, you know what kind of debt I'm talking about. I've been there. I did that. And it stinks. It stinks. Because I don't even have enough food to give somebody else. And there are other people that need food. Because we made some bad decisions. In the very first year of marriage, we've been together for almost eight years. It's only the first year that we made all those bad decisions. The last of the seven, we've been paying for them. <laughs> Can I hear a holy amen? amen. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But I'll tell you what. After the eighth year, there's going to be a lot of these that have disappeared. And we're going to see this light in the end of the tunnel is going to smack us right in the face. And it's going to be awesome. That keeps us from being gracious. From being givers. What kind of debt do you have? It could be financial. It could be a resource. It could be a, a task that you owe someone. <coughs> or honestly, scripturally, it could be a sin debt. That there's a sin that you owe. Give to God. And he's waiting for 